this morning. All right, let's take our word. We're going to do our I was created by God. And if you're a visitor here this morning, listen to every line of this and apply it to your life. I was created by God for a great purpose. His divine power now gives me everything I need to fulfill it. What Jesus did through the incarnation, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and the enthronement as king was for me and all the created order. I am filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. I live to advance his kingdom, to bring him glory, and enjoy him forever. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. There are angels assigned to my life, and I will always be an overcomer. And Lord, as we continue in the purpose that you created us for, we want to be equipped for every good work. Lord, we want to move in the power of Holy Spirit. We want to live our lives so that it counts and it matters in eternity. And Lord, we want to represent you well in the earth. And Father, I just thank you today as we share, Lord, that you would just give uh, by reminder, even by revelation, uh, more understanding of how we live our lives for your glory. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for just bringing that application to each life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let me first say the, uh, the chili ride uh, wasn't chili. It was actually pretty nice. Beautiful evening. Go ahead and throw some more of those photos up there just so what I'm doing is making those who missed it feel like, oh, I shouldn't have missed it. So you'll sign up next year. Uh, and even the gifts were like laser inscribed wooden spoons and things like that very prestigious of course and uh, lots of folks had uh, a great time as you can see it was a beautiful uh, you could see the the sunlit there or the moonlit skyline all right we're good we're done amen we're gonna start so <clears throat> Terry got up and shared about the sound, and all through the service, uh, this was very important. Last week, I'm going to kick off my uh, PowerPoint, so if you'd put the first one up there, a security alert. Well, we don't want that. Uh, last week, we talked about identity, but we started with this because last weekend was the head of the year for the Jewish New Year called Rosh Hashanah, and we are now in... 5784, which to many of us, that's those numbers are foreign. We don't track that way, but that's okay. Uh, the Hebrew calendar does. And there's a significance there. God has placed in his people and in time many different prophetic things that speak to us. And this particular year, and if you know, and we said it last year, that the numbers and letters are the same in the Hebrew language. So uh, what we did is we just kind of took some of these numbers, like five, which is the number of grace. How many need grace this year? How many need to walk in that supernatural empowerment? I certainly do. The number of seven literally means wholeness or completion. And that needs to be our ongoing expectation that God is moving us into greater and greater wholeness and completion, all right? Doesn't mean if you're, you know, a certain age, all right, now I'm complete. No, we're always being uh, upgraded in our walk with God. So the number of eight, as we know, uh, through many things in the Word, is a number for new beginnings. Last week I said that was the day I rested because I had watched my grandchild, my wife and I did, the whole week. And so day seven became our freedom day of jubilee and rest. Uh, but it was all a great experience. And then my son brings over his, his two kids. So, you know, it just kind of keeps growing. So we're in a new beginning. But it's also the word, the Hebrew letter is the word for mouth. And I think it's the Hebrew letter pay, if I'm, is that right? Thank you. And, uh, and so it's very important. Even the message today, what we'll be talking about has to do with voice. And also that, that is a picture of the breath. So we're expecting the breath of God 
in this decade that we're in. And how many of you are kind of watching some of the news, the Christian news, that's tracking all the baptisms that keep taking place in a major way across our nation? Well, that's only four or five of you, so I'll just rehearse some of it. College campuses, churches, all kinds of different venues, they go from having a meeting to, oh, 200 people want to get baptized. A thousand people are getting baptized. So God is, the wind of God is blowing. The awakening is happening. The sound, which requires the wind, the voice, the mouth, is being released this year. And then lastly, um, we went from 83 to 84, and four is the picture and also the number that indicates doorway or gate or threshold. There's a pattern in Jesus' life and ministry that I believe is a model for each one of us. And I think seeing and understanding that pattern uh, gives us a way to say, Oh, I see what's going on right now. And I've talked about this before and preached about it uh, probably enough. So some people in here, it's their eighth time. It's their new beginning of hearing it again. But Jesus went through a process right from the very beginning of his ministry at his baptism of identity and then affirmation. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he went from there into this next gate or this next threshold or this next doorway. He went into the doorway of the wilderness. How many of you have ever gone into the doorway of the wilderness? My sons and I drove to uh, California a few years back. They needed to get a vehicle there. My son was working there. And uh, at one point, we went through Texas and going out of Texas... We actually started through, it must have been a doorway into the wilderness because you really had to watch how much gas you had because there were not many cities or uh, gas stations along the way. And then the gas stations that were along the way were really tourist traps selling souvenirs and trinkets because you were in the wilderness, I guess, or in the desert. But Jesus was there, and the title of this message, which I think is the third part of that pattern, it is this, contending for the faith, contending for the faith. See, I need this message for me. And Peter said, he said, I think it's right to stir you up by reminding you. So anytime I say something again, I'm just stirring you up and stirring myself up by reminding you. Everybody said amen. Amen. So whatever I speak on, I'm usually speaking to me. It's something that I'm saying, Lord, apply this to my life. So here's the scripture, or here's the, what Jude says. Jude, uh, I believe it's right here. Nope. Oh, back me up here. I'm going to read the scripture to you. I didn't have it written in, into the PowerPoint. But Jude 1.3 says this, Beloved, when I, gave, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. If you've been watching any kind of news at all, probably not secular news, but other things, you would recognize that the faith, the Christian faith, is being contended for around the world. Many nations, there's martyrdom taking place at unprecedented level. In places like the United Kingdom and England, the, they have created these laws so that you cannot be anywhere close to an abortion clinic at all. You just, if you're a Christian and you have something to pass out or you just want to pray with someone that's, that's walking into a place, you can't even do it. Recently, a lady that is in charge of a pro-life ministry was just standing outside a good distance away, but on the sidewalk and praying silently. She wasn't even moving her lips. She was just thinking and praying thoughts in her mind, and she got arrested. And it's been six months. She finally, finally a judge smart enough said, no, stop politicizing. Stop arresting people for what they think in their mind. 
So persecution and contending is a real thing. So what is Jude doing? He's writing, he's got a brokenness in his spirit because there were some things going on in the church at large. Jude was the brother, one of the brothers of Jesus, and he became a leader. And he's writing with this, he's carrying this burden, this passion to contend for the faith. So he pleads with them to do it. So the faith, which is, what is our faith? It's the body of the Christian doctrine. What is that? Oh, let me just give you a few points here really quickly. So I'm going to grab my glasses if you don't mind, just like Terry. Our Christian doctrine, our faith, it does not change with the changing of times. It is not something that man discovered or manufactured. It is the Holy Spirit's revelation to us. The historic faith is the truth that clusters around the person and works of Jesus. Now, the fundamentals are the faith. This is just a reminder. The ver- we believe in the verbal and inspiration of Scripture, supernatural birth of Christ, sinless sovereign life of God manifested in the flesh through His Son, Jesus, Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, Christ's physical resurrection from the dead and triumph ascension to the Father, which we declared already, the absolute necessity of the new birth so that we become a new creation in Him, and the eminent return of the Lord. How many believe that? If you do, say amen. 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 I'm in the right place this morning. There's also the commissions of faith. Two of them are Mark 16, that we're to preach the gospel throughout the world. And our missions conference is coming up, and it underscores that. Thank you, Nathan, for underscoring that whether we're at work in our family, uh, our, our geography where we live, or even the geography around where we come to worship, we should be preaching the gospel there, reaching out and touching lives because Matthew 28 said, Jesus, when he left, he said, go and disciple the nations, okay? Go and disciple the nations. Contending means to fight while standing on the very thing that's being assaulted. I believe probably most of you have had either your faith, your values, things that you stand for in some way assaulted, if not by an individual, for sure by Satan himself through thoughts and accusations and other things. So contending means to fight while standing on the very thing being assaulted. It means to stand against all who undermine it. Contend with, it also means contending with adversaries, endeavor with strenuous zeal, or to strive to obtain something. Here's the reality today in the world we live in in 2023, soon to be 2024. We see it and we feel it all around us. The contending that the culture, many of the mountains of culture, contending you know we all check out the news once in a while and we think my goodness everything they're saying is almost simply totally 180 degrees out of phase of how I live and what I believe and what I know is to be true so whether we know it or not there's a contending you click on uh, a movie to watch It doesn't take long before those values are contending against your values. They're maybe subtly warring against that which you hold to be true. Ephesians 6 talks about our warfare, and it has this phrase in it. It says to put on the armor of God. We know what that is. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, belt of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit and shield of faith and all those have a a a tremendous significance the armor of god but it says and when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand you know in our military our soldiers stay fit do exercises shoot millions of rounds of ammunition just for practice and all of that why Because they are training for the day of evil. 
if they are, have to step into a day of contending or warfare. So the message today is about warfare, because that's what contending is at different levels. And I'm not trying to give this whole summary on what warfare is, but I'll get to my main points here in just a second. So often we can feel overwhelmed by circumstances. We can have anxiety, fear of the future, confused, and sometimes even a sense of surrender, depending on how intense things are going and how we're feeling. And sometimes we can be isolated. Well, this guy isn't a biblical guy, but he's a historical guy. You know him as Winston Churchill. In one of his famous speeches, he said this, this is the lesson, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never get in, give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. And so the word that we have and that is in our heart is designed to be able to live up to that truth that Winston Churchill so powerfully gave. And you know that it was because of his words and the hope that his words gave over and over to England that they were able to stand even being bombarded over and over again by the enemy. So let me say this, we will never give up. And we will contend for the faith. And you know, we need to be saying this now. While there's not people monitoring and saying, what are they saying in that building? There could be, there are days in other countries, and maybe it's here in this country too, where people will be planted in a congregation to make sure they don't say anything that's upsetting either toward the government or toward an individual or toward a mandate or something of that nature. It happened during COVID. It's happened in Canada. If you've read any of that news, uh, they, are, they have been under quite a bit of oppression. But we need to say, we will, Stephen, contend for our faith. We need a warrior spirit. Jesus is both the Lamb of God, humble, meek, a lowly servant riding in to give his life on the cross victoriously, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah who rose with resurrection power and glory, and he's a victorious champion over death, hell, and the grave. And so we, we as believers many times conduct ourselves in a very meek and humble way as we're serving just like Jesus did, but it, when it comes time to stand for our faith and stand for what we believe and, and contend, we need to remember that heart of the line of the tribe of Judah is also in us. It's in our faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to rem remind us this morning of just three very fundamental ways that we contend, and this is certainly not exhaustive at all. And the first one is, is simply contending with the word. You know, the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love freedom. I want freedom. I want more and more freedom. I don't want anything capturing my thoughts. I don't want to be physically, uh, you know, held captive in any way. Uh, I remember I was just reminded of this because the kids told me about it the other day. Uh, if you've ever kind of had a challenge with claustrophobia, you don't like tight spaces, okay? And I've rebuked that thing, and I think I'm free of it, okay? But I wasn't free of it that day, okay? And so this was years ago. We were in Disney, and there was this really cool ride that everybody was going to go on. And and so I said, okay, I'll stand in line and, you know, this kind of thing. But it was kind of in a dark room, and you stood up for this ride. Now, what's it called? Do you remember? Do you remember what that ride was called? It's not important. Okay, that totally is not important. you remember? Space mission. Space mission? All right, so I love space, and I wanted to go on a space mission, okay? 
And so I'm, I'm standing, the, the, everybody else gets in, everybody else in the family, every last one of my family is there, and I'm kind of the last, and it's like, yeah, I'm kind of looking it over, and then all of a sudden, clamp, clamp, and I'm totally restricted, you know, and it wasn't that I was afraid that I was going to be shaken around, I just didn't want the restriction, I didn't want to be have that lack of freedom, even for that one minute or two minutes that it was going to take. You know, our Revolutionary War soldiers, a very small percentage of people gave their lives, gave their, their fortunes, they gave their sacred honor for our freedom. You know, and today we even have veterans here in this house. You guys did the same thing. You signed up for the same thing. I will give my last ounce of devotion to protect this nation. And, and we still today have those that are. So freedom is, freedom is very pricey, and we are to contend for it. Amen? Amen? So Jesus was doing that. So when he went through the doorway into the wilderness to contend with the devil, uh, you know, he fasted for 40 days. So you think about it. If you fasted for 40 days, you're literally contending with your own flesh. You're contending with the mind. Can you imagine what's going on in your mind as you're fasting for 40 days? Your will and your emotions. So his body and his soul, he was, he was being victorious over. And at the weakest moment, what happens? Satan comes. And he attacks those areas of his life. And I won't go through that. You know that. He, uh, but, but what did Jesus do? He contended with the word. He contended with the word. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. So he contended over and over. The three areas, if you study it out, he contended against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I'm going to give you just a scripture that everybody should know. You probably know it by heart. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This word is designed to train us in righteousness so that we're not contending just out of our opinion or whatever comes to our mind, but we would be contending out of the righteousness of God so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This next one, Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow. That's pretty deep, okay? And able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word is alive. The word is active. I need to be reminded of that, Pastor Stan, that when I read the Word, it's not just retelling me the story or the account or the information, but I am reading something that Holy Spirit quickens to me and says, this Word is alive. Jesus was called the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. It's alive, it's living, and it's active. So the activity of this word in my life, as I ponder it, as I read it, as, I, as even the prophet says, as I ate the word and it was sweet to me, it becomes, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So a two-edged sword, two edges, I think that first edge is to cut my own heart like a surgical edge instrument because there are times when my heart needs some surgery whether it's forgiveness or patience or it's something I need the word to kind of you know do a little surgery on me and get me back into where I need to be but that second edge is to cut off the lies of the enemy to cut off the attacks of the enemy to cut off those things that want to attack so the the uh, that two-edged 
If you look it up in the Greek, it's also the meaning of a two-mouth sword. It's a two-mouth sword. That's interesting. So I see that as the mouth of God speaking through his word to me, and then my mouth speaking that word out. And I won't spend much time here, but I just want to say it is really important that you speak the word out loud. It's just really, really, really important because you are, it's coming up. Consciously, you are forming the words. You are speaking them out into the atmosphere. You are hearing these words again in your hearing. And I believe it's just a practice that helps it go deep in your spirit and helps to remember it in your mind. Reading the word to your children, to your family, praying the word. If you don't have anything to pray, start opening the Psalms. See what David prayed. Start praying. He, he prayed some radical prayers, okay? All right, moving right along here. Every, give everybody hope, right, Jonathan? Just say yes. Yes. The next dynamic is this. It's worship. It's worship. So in 2 Chronicles 20, 21, it's about Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a king and a righteous king. And, you know, he ruled pretty much pretty well. He made a few mistakes along the way. But he was told of a massive army that was heading their direction. Runners had come and said, hey, they are amassing for war and they are coming to take our land, to take our families, etc. And so he calls out, let me get to where I need to be, yeah. So he calls out the nation to come to corporate prayer. And if you read through that, that chapter, he brought the little ones, he brought the mothers, the fathers, the children, and they came and they just, you know, cried out to God. And in the middle of that corporate prayer, someone had a prophetic word that declared that God was going to give them the victory, that he himself was going to fight for them. And so he said, just go to the certain place and be ready. So they went, and what did they do? You know the story. They put the singers, they put the worshipers in front. And this, he said, after consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Years ago, um, when I was in Bible school, there was a we would, our school would take a yearly trip to New Orleans to Mardi Gras because we knew that was a place that was totally broken. People would come from all over the country; they were totally broken, and so we went there to minister. And this particular year, there were two hundred of us. We multiple buses to get down there. We slept on pews in a church and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, so this one night, our, our leader, Pastor Mike Massa, uh, said, this is what we're going to do tonight. I think it was probably maybe even Fat Tuesday, the, the biggest night of, of Mardi Gras. He said, all 200 of us are just going to parade straight down through Bourbon Street. Now, you've maybe seen pictures of Mardi Gras Hope you've never been there. Pictures of Mardi Gras. You know, they got balconies and people hanging, all kinds of perversion and, you know, all kinds of alcohol and everything else. And so 200 of us just walked side by side in a, in a parade fashion from one end of Bourbon Street to the other end. And all we did, he said, I don't want anybody to talk to anybody. I don't want you to have conversations with people. He said, all we're going to do is sing Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. And we sang that all the way down Bourbon Street. And when we got to the end, we came together and still ministered. And people actually came down from the balcony and came down into our crowd to give their life to the Lord. You know, it was that whole picture of sending the singers out beforehand and just giving him honor and praise. Give him 15 this week if you were following or if you were listening. I'm just going to give you this little short thing that Dutch said. But he, 
He talked about believing for a baptism of fire and impartation out of one of the dreams that were given. And he outlined the steps uh, for that. He said, first, if you want, you know, that impartation that God wants to bring upon our nation and into each individual, he said, you first have to choose. He said, they chose to go to the upper room in obedience to what Jesus said. So they go to the upper room. They first, number one, chose. Secondly, they positioned themselves to do that. Okay? They got there and said, okay, we're here, Lord. Speak to us. Thirdly, you know, they asked. They asked, we want what you have said would come. And then fourthly, they worshiped. And so he says this. He says, remember, however... It isn't about the praise itself, and we actually sang that in our, one of our, our second song today. It isn't about the praise itself that God needs or wants. He is not insecure, needing our affirmation, nor is he arrogant or conceited, wanting to hear how great he is. John 4.23 tells us God is looking for actually seeking worshipers not worship. It's the person, you and me, his kids, that God loves and wants. Not the song, but the singer. We are his worship. God is looking for worshipers. Every day when you think about, well, I should spend a little time in the word. I should spend a little time in prayer. I didn't put prayer as one of these dynamics because I'm including that in our, in our worship our worship of prayer. In fact, Dutch goes on and says, quiet contemplation can be worship. Actions can be worship. Obedience is worship. Work, when done for his glory, is worship. Giving, reading God's word, serving others. All of these things can be considered as worship when done with worshipful hearts. So I believe the word is a powerful weapon to contend with. I believe that our worship, and I'm only stirring us all up by way of reminder, is so important. It is number one. Secondly, it is our voice. So when we're speaking the word, when we're speaking out worship, it is the breath of God. It is the voice coming forth. Let me give you the third one and last one, and that is witness. In Acts 1.8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. You will be my witnesses. The word there for witness is this word, martus, one who remembers, one who has information or knowledge one who can use that information to bring something to light. It also refers to those who confessed Christ, were a witness of Christ, and called themselves Christians and were martyred. They were killed. They were a witness. But from the root of this word, we also have another word for testimony, and it's the word maturia. So Bill Johnson does a masterful job of telling us why our witness and our testimony is important. So this short three-minute video, I want him to explain that power of testimony. Go ahead and turn that on and hit the house lights if you would, please. Hi. A number of years ago, I embarked on a journey. I asked the Lord a question. I had read a passage in Revelation 19.10 that just leapt off the page at me. It says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I remember when I read that, I was stunned by the words. I'd read it many times before, but this, this time seemed to become food. And yet I couldn't have explained it if my life depended on it. I just knew... I needed to discover that one. So I said, God, teach me what this means. Show me what it means. And over a period of time, people would bring me stories, testimonies of what Jesus had done. A testimony is a spoken or written record of any of God's activities in our lives. And they would bring me a story. And I remember one particular man that afternoon that I prayed the prayer, stood in the doorway of my office, 
told me what God was doing in his marriage. And then he stopped and he said, you can share this with anyone you like. It hit me that that was in part the answer to my prayer. He was saying, share my story with someone else to give them hope of what God would do. And I realized the testimony of Jesus prophesies to the people who hear what God is willing to do for them. Testimonies are important because they're stories. They're stories about God's nature. They reveal his heart. They reveal his person. They reveal what he values. They reveal his interactions with people, his history with mankind. And every time we tell a story, we actually create an opportunity for that story to be duplicated. I was stunned when I found one of the Old Testament words for testimony actually came from another word in the Hebrew, a root word that meant to do again. So the very nature of keeping the testimony as he commands in scripture was that he was already committed to do the same thing again. It fascinates me. I've experimented with this through the years. We share stories to see uh, what God would do. We share stories just to bring encouragement. We share stories basically just to give God glory. We report what he's done and people celebrate his kindness. But I don't want to stop there because I have found that when you share a story in the room, it becomes pregnant with the possibility of God doing that same miracle again. And one of the reasons we share the story of God's interventions in our lives is it keeps people aware of the nature of God, the heart of God, and there's a readiness to see God do it again. I encourage you, listen to testimonies, share them. You'll change the atmosphere that you live in. Do it again. Do it again, Lord. Let's have the worship team come and prayer team can get ready. I want to, out of that, I want to, I want to give you a challenge out of just what he shared and what I've been sharing today. And that challenge, especially for this particular category of testimony, the word is a, is a weapon. Worship is a weapon. It helps us contend and our testimony helps us contend. And here's the challenge. Rehearse the story, your story of God's work and his faithfulness in your life. Rehearse it to yourself. Be in prayer, be wherever, be alone, be in the car driving somewhere, take a walk, whatever it might be. Rehearse God's faithfulness. Now, um, in our lives, there's been plenty of challenges, plenty of places where maybe we failed uh, and we walked through some stuff, just tough places that we've walked through in life, but the grace of God has come. I want you to rehearse that and see where God has brought you through that story and blessed you and, and walked with you. So rehearse your story of God's work and faithfulness and even write it down if you need to. Journal it down. Do something like that. Secondly, rehearse it to another believer. Paul did it over and over again. You read in the New Testament, Paul and others give their testimony, whether it's before a king, whether it's to a church, whether it's to, you know, one another. So rehearse it to someone else most likely a believer. That's, that's the next easiest thing to do, right? Um, even this week, I rehearsed a little part of my testimony to someone to help bring a little perspective or a little encouragement, and then get ready to rehearse it to someone who needs it. Maybe a coworker, maybe someone that's walking through something that's pretty difficult I, the last thing I did before I walked out here, I had scribbled out some notes on my whiteboard, and I thought, you know, these are important things too. Let me say this. The very nature of faith is to believe beyond what you see or feel. That's the very nature of faith. Where is our starting place to contend or to war for that faith? You know, the psalmist says, I look to the hills for my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let my foot slip. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor moon by night. He'll keep you from all evil. He'll guard your heart. Our help, our contending starts 
from God, from where comes our help. Satan wants you to battle only from the soulish realm. See, he wanted to get Jesus to battle from, the, from his soul. He was hungry. He, the appeal to all of the, the kingdoms of this world that the enemy put before him and his, even his a pride. So Satan wants to battle from only the soul realm, mind, will, emotions, more so even from our emotions and mind. Because when your will joins your faith, you are unstoppable. Stand up with me if you would, please. You need to hear that again. When your will joins your faith, you are unstoppable. If he can remind you of your sin, your weakness, your failures, and get your emotions to dwell on that, then he has paralyzed you at the very first gate or the very first threshold of the victory that God wants you to walk in, wants me to walk in. So this witness, let me just say this, as Bill Johnson said about testimony, God has a track record and it's a good track record. And I'm wanting just to remind you of what is God's track record in your life. Victory begets victory begets victory. Jonathan, when you share a victory in your life to someone else who needs a victory in that area, you are literally together saying, God, do it again. Do it in me. It could be a victory that somebody shares about a prodigal that came home. That begets another victory. It could be about a, a victory or testimony about a marriage being healed or a testimony of healing. Whatever it is, we say, God, do it again. We will win the war. We will contend by faith, and we will see the word flourish in us. We are going to see worship individually and corporately flourish in us. And we are going to see the testimony of your lives continue to grow, but also be voiced. Be also be voiced. Amen. Worship team, would you come, please? If you want to respond in any way and you say, hey, look, I'm in a war right now. I, I'm warring over my healing. I'm warring over a relationship. I'm warring over a, a prodigal in my family. I'm warring over a battle that's taking place in my mind. I'm warring over something. Warring is not negative. In fact, David warred Goliath. There was not a negative. The battle was real. The threats were real. The danger was real. But that victory over Goliath catapulted David into his next place of destiny and victory. So over and over again, that which is in front of you is designed to take you to the next place. Father, I just pause right now as we get ready to sing again. I just pause and say, you are with us in this contending that we can find ourselves in. Lord, we're not looking for a fight. We just look to live for your glory. But in doing so, we know that there is a warfare that many times is happening around us, happening to us, or even against us. And we will stand strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Because your word says, they that know their God will be strong and do exploits. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against powers and principalities. And your victory this morning is our victory. Lord, your victory of the cross is our eternal victory, Lord, in this life. And so, Father, we thank you that as we war, we're not warring from a place of fear and anxiety because, Lord, you gave us your word to be instilled into our heart so that we literally are armed and dangerous to the darkness, to the evil. So, Lord, I thank you that you are raising up a church that understand the times and know what to do. You're raising up a church that's being equipped with every good work. You're raising up, Lord, a people that are being trained, and your word is very adequate for that training. And, Lord, we just thank you that we can rejoice in all that you have for each family, each home, each life. 
And even as we step into the greater contending for a city, for a nation, Lord, you give us everything that we need. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. As we sing this last song, if you want any, any ministry at all, we'll just do it then. You can come down. Uh, we're going to stay for a time of connection. Today is a connection Sunday, and uh, we just want to fellowship for a little bit. And you might say, well, what is that? I've never been here before. We bring out refreshments, and we just hang out for an extra 30, 40 minutes in God's presence. Go ahead, worship team. king forever and we do say lord take everything all of it let it be for you let there be a song and a sound that comes from our life that comes out of our mouth our testimony our worship your word spoken into the vacuum of our culture today that needs to hear the truth that will set them free we thank you, Lord, that we stand on a firm foundation. And, Lord, we contend from a place, Lord, of great strength in you. I thank you for it today. I thank you, Lord, that families today, Lord, are realigning their hearts, their homes, their lives in your word and in your worship and in the testimony of what you have done not only in their lives, Lord, but in the lives, 
Lord, of the saints in all these years. And we just give you thanks and we declare today the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please stay with us for our connect time. And we'll linger over here on the left. If you didn't get prayer and you wanted to come down and have prayer for anything, please do that. Don't forget to go get your children if you have them upstairs. Bring them back down for our connect time if you would. And we also want to welcome some new people into our church family.